Section 5 of Beacon Lights of History, Volume 1, The Old Pagan Civilizations. Beacon Lights of History, Volume 1, The Old Pagan Civilizations by John Lord. Religion of the Greeks and Romans, Part 1. Classic Mythology. Religion among the lively and imaginative Greeks took a different form from that of the Aryan race in India or Persia. However, the ideas of their divinities originated in their relations to the thought and life of the people. Their gods were neither abstractions nor symbols. They were simply men and women, immortal, yet having a beginning, with passions and appetites like ordinary mortals. They love, they hate, they eat, they drink. They have adventures and misfortunes like men, only differing from men in the superiority of their gifts, in their miraculous endowments, in their stupendous feats, in their more than gigantic size, in their supernal beauty, in their intensified pleasures. It was not their aim to raise mortals to the skies, but to enjoy themselves in feasting and love-making, not even to govern the world, but to protect their particular worshippers, taking part and interest in human quarrels, without reference to justice or right, and without communicating any great truths for the guidance of mankind. The religion of Greece consisted of a series of myths, creations for the most part of the poets, and therefore properly called a mythology. Yet in some respects the gods of Greece resembled those of Phoenicia and Egypt, being the powers of nature, and named after the sun, moon, and planets. Their priests did not form a sacerdotal caste as in India and Egypt. They were more like officers of the state, to perform certain functions or duties pertaining to rites, ceremonies, and sacrifices. They taught no moral or spiritual truths to the people, nor were they held in extraordinary reverence. They were not ascetics or enthusiasts. Among them were no great reformers or prophets, as among the sacerdotal class of the Jews or the Hindus. They had even no sacred books and claimed no esoteric knowledge, nor was their office hereditary. They were appointed by the rulers of the state, or elected by the people themselves. They imposed no restraints on the conscience, and apparently cared little for morals, leaving the people to an unbounded freedom to act and think for themselves, so far as they did not interfere with prescribed usages and laws. The real objects of Greek worship were beauty, grace, and heroic strength. The people worshipped no supreme creator, no providential governor, no ultimate judge of human actions. They had no aspirations for heaven and no fear of hell. They did not feel accountable for their deeds or thoughts or words to an irresistible power working for righteousness or truth. They had no religious sense apart from wonder or admiration of the glories of nature, or the good or evil which might result from the favor or hatred of the divinities they accepted. These divinities, moreover, were not manifestations of supreme power and intelligence, but were creations of the fancy, as they came from popular legends, or the brains of poets, or the hands of artists, or the speculations of philosophers. And as everything in Greece was beautiful and radiant, the sea, the sky, the mountains, and the valleys, so was religion cheerful, seen in all the festivals which took the place of the Sabbaths and holy days of more spiritually minded peoples. The worshippers of the gods danced and played and sported to the sounds of musical instruments, and reveled in joyous libations, in feasts, and imposing processions, in whatever would amuse the mind or intoxicate the senses. The gods were rather unseen companions in pleasures, in sports, in athletic contests, and warlike enterprises, than beings to be adored for moral excellence or supernal knowledge. Heaven was so near at hand that their own heroes climbed to it and became demigods. Every grove, every fountain, every river, every beautiful spot had its presiding deity, while every wonder of nature, the sun, the moon, the stars, the tempest, the thunder, the lightning, was impersonated as an awful power for good or evil. To them temples were erected, within which were their shrines and images in human shape, glistening with gold and gems, and wrought in every form of grace or strength or beauty, and by artists of marvelous excellence. This polytheism of Greece was exceedingly complicated, but was not so degrading as that of Egypt, since the gods were not represented by the forms of hideous animals, and the worship of them was not attended by revolting ceremonies and yet it was divested of all spiritual aspirations, and had but little effect on personal struggles for truth or holiness. It was human and worldly, not lofty or even reverential, except among the few who had deep religious wants. One of its characteristic features was the acknowledged impotence of the gods to secure future happiness. 
In fact, the future was generally ignored, and even immortality was but a dream of philosophers. Men lived not in view of future rewards and punishments, or future existence at all, but for the enjoyment of the present, and the gods themselves set the example of an immoral life. Even Zeus, the father of gods and men, to whom absolute supremacy was ascribed, the work of creation, and all majesty and serenity, took but little interest in human affairs, and lived on Olympian heights like a sovereign surrounded with the instruments of his will, freely indulging in those pleasures which all lofty moral codes have forbidden, and taking part in the quarrels, jealousies, and enmities of his divine associates. Greek mythology had its source in the legends of a remote antiquity probably among the Pelasgians, the early inhabitants of Greece, which they brought with them in their migration from their original settlement, or perhaps from Egypt and Phoenicia. Herodotus, and he is not often wrong, ascribes a great part of the mythology which the Greek poets elaborated to a Phoenician or Egyptian source. The legends have also some similarity to the poetic creations of the ancient Persians, who delighted in fairies and genii and extravagant exploits, like the labors of Hercules. The faults and foibles of deified mortals were transmitted to posterity and incorporated with the attributes of the supreme divinity, and hence the mixture of the mighty and the mean which marks the characters of the Iliad and the Odyssey. The Greeks adopted Oriental fables and accommodated them to those heroes who figured in their own country in the earliest times. The labors of Hercules originated in Egypt and relate to the annual progress of the sun in the zodiac. The rape of Proserpine, the wanderings of Ceres, the Eleusian mysteries, and the orgies of Bacchus were all imported from Egypt or Phoenicia, while the wars between the gods and the giants were celebrated in the romantic annals of Persia. The oracle of Dodona was copied from that of Ammon in Thebes, and the oracle of Apollo at Delphos has a similar source. Behind the Oriental legends, which form the basis of Grecian mythology, there was, in all probability, in those ancient times before the Pelasgians were known as Ionians and the Hellenes as Dorians, a mystical and indefinite idea of supreme power, as among the Persians, the Hindus, and the esoteric priests of Egypt. In all the ancient religions, the farther back we go, the purer and loftier do we find the popular religion. Belief in supreme deity underlies all the Eastern theogenies, which belief, however, was soon perverted or lost sight of. There is great difference of opinion among philosophers as to the origin of myths, whether they began in fable and came to be regarded as history, or began as human history and were poetized into fable. My belief is that in the earliest ages of the world there were no mythologies. Fables were the creations of those who sought to amuse or control the people, who have ever delighted in the marvelous. As the magnificent, the vast, the sublime, which was seen in nature, impressed itself on the imagination of the Orientals and ended in legends, so did allegory in process of time multiply fictions and fables to an indefinite extent. And what were symbols among Eastern nations became impersonations in the poetry of Greece. Grecian mythology was a vast system of impersonated forces, beginning with the legends of heroes and ending with the personification of the faculties of the mind and the manifestations of nature, in deities who presided over festivals, cities, groves, and mountains, with all the infirmities of human nature, and without calling out exalted sentiments of love or reverence. They are all creations of the imagination, invested with human traits and adapted to the genius of the people who were far from being religious in the sense that the Hindus and Egyptians were. It was the natural and not the supernatural that filled their souls. It was art they worshipped and not the God who created the heavens and the earth, and who exacts of his creatures obedience and faith. In regard to the gods and goddesses of the Grecian pantheon, we observe that most of them were immoral, at least they had the usual infirmities of men. They are thus represented by the poets, probably to please the people, who like all other peoples had to make their own conceptions of God. For even a miraculous revelation of deity must be interpreted by those who receive it, according to their own understanding of the qualities revealed. The ancient Romans, themselves stern, earnest, practical, had an almost oriental reverence for their gods, so that their Jupiter, father of heaven, was a majestic, powerful, all-seeing, severely just national deity, regarded by them much as the Jehovah of the Hebrews was by that nation. When in later times the conquest of eastern countries and of Macedon and Greece brought in luxury, works of art, foreign literature, and all the delightful but enervating influences of aestheticism, 
The Romans became corrupted, and gradually began to identify their own more noble deities with the beautiful but unprincipled, self-indulgent, and tricky set of gods and goddesses of the Greek mythology. The Greek Zeus, with whom were associated majesty and dominion, and who reigned supreme in the celestial hierarchy, who as the chief god of the skies, the god of storms, ruler of the atmosphere, was the favorite deity of the Aryan race, the Indra of the Hindus, the Jupiter of the Romans, was in his Grecian presentment a rebellious son, a faithless husband, and sometimes an unkind father. His character was a combination of weakness and strength, anything but a pattern to be imitated, or even to be reverenced. He was the impersonation of power and dignity, represented by the poets as having such immense strength that if he had hold of one end of a chain, and all the gods held the other, with the earth fastened to it, he would be able to move them all. Poseidon, Roman Neptune, the brother of Zeus, was represented as the god of the ocean, and was worshipped chiefly in the maritime states. His morality was no higher than that of Zeus. Moreover, he was rough, boisterous, and vindictive. He was hostile to Troy, and yet persecuted Ulysses. Apollo, the next great personage of the Olympian divinities, was more respectable morally than his father. He was the sun-god of the Greeks, and was the embodiment of divine prescience, of healing skill, of musical and poetical productiveness, and hence the favorite of the poets. He had a form of ideal beauty, grace, and vigor, inspired by unerring wisdom and insight into futurity. He was obedient to the will of Zeus, to whom he was not much inferior in power. Temples were erected to this favorite deity in every part of Greece, and he was supposed to deliver oracular responses in several cities, especially at Delphos. Hephaestus, Roman Vulcan, the god of fire, was a sort of jester at the Olympian court, and provoked perpetual laughter from his awkwardness and lameness. He forged the thunderbolts for Zeus, and was the armorer of heaven. It accorded with the grim humor of the poets to make this clumsy blacksmith the husband of Aphrodite, the queen of beauty and love. Ares, Roman Mars, the god of war, was represented as cruel, lawless, and greedy of blood, and as occupying a subordinate position, receiving orders from Apollo and Athene. Hermes, Roman Mercury, was the impersonation of commercial dealings, and of course was full of tricks and thievery, the Olympian man of business, industrious, inventive, untruthful, and dishonest. He was also the god of eloquence. Besides these six great male divinities, there were six goddesses, the most important of whom was Hera, Roman, Juno, wife of Zeus, and hence the queen of heaven. She exercised her husband's prerogatives, and thundered and shook Olympus, but she was proud, vindictive, jealous, unscrupulous, and cruel, a poor model for women to imitate. The Greek poets, however, had a poor opinion of the female sex, and hence represent this deity without those elements of character which we most admire in a woman, gentleness, softness, tenderness, and patience. She scolded her august husband so perpetually that he gave way to complaints before the assembled deities, and that too with a bitterness hardly to be reconciled with our notions of dignity. The Roman Juno, before the identification of the two goddesses, was a nobler character, being the queen of heaven, the protectress of virgins and of matrons, and was also the celestial housewife of the nation, watching over its revenues and its expenses. She was the especial goddess of chastity, and loose women were forbidden to touch her altars. Athene, Roman Minerva, however, the goddess of wisdom, had a character without a flaw, and ranked with Apollo in wisdom. She even expostulated with Zeus himself when he was wrong, but on the other hand she had a few attractive feminine qualities, and no amiable weaknesses. Artemis, Roman Diana, was a shadowy divinity, a pale reflection of her brother Apollo. She presided over the pleasures of the chase, in which the Greeks delighted, a masculine female who took but little interest in anything intellectual. Aphrodite, Roman Venus, was the impersonation of all that was weak and erring in the nature of woman, the goddess of sensual desire, of mere physical beauty, silly, childish, and vain, utterly odious in a moral point of view, and mentally contemptible. This goddess was represented as exerting a great influence even when despised, fascinating yet revolting, admired and yet corrupting. She was not of much importance among the Romans, who were far from being sentimental or passionate, until the growth of the legend of their Trojan origin. Then, as mother of Aeneas, their progenitor, she took a high rank, and the Greek poets furnished her character. Hestia, 
Roman Vesta, presided over the private hearths and homesteads of the Greeks, and imparted to them a sacred character. Her personality was vague, but she represented the purity which among both Greeks and Romans is attached to home and domestic life. Demeter, Roman Ceres, represented Mother Earth, and thus was closely associated with agriculture and all operations of tillage and bread-making. As agriculture is the primitive and most important of all human vocations, this deity presided over civilization and law-giving, and occupied an important position in the Eleusian Mysteries. These were the twelve Olympian divinities, or greater gods, but they represent only a small part of the Grecian pantheon. There was Dionysus, Roman Bacchus, the god of drunkenness. This deity presided over vineyards, and his worship was attended with disgraceful orgies, with wild dances, noisy revels, exciting music, and frenzied demonstrations. Leto, Roman Latona, another wife of Zeus, and mother of Apollo and Diana, was a very different personage from Hera, being the impersonation of all those womanly qualities which are valued in a woman, silent, unobtrusive, condescending, chaste, kindly, ready to help and tend, and subordinating herself to her children. Persephone, Roman, Proserpina, was the queen of the dead, ruling the infernal realm even more distinctly than her husband Pluto, severely pure as she was awful and terrible, but there were no temples erected to her, as the Greeks did not trouble themselves much about the future state. The minor deities of the Greeks were innumerable, and were identified with every separate thing which occupied their thoughts, with mountains, rivers, capes, towns, fountains, rocks, with domestic animals, with monsters of the deep, with demons and departed heroes, with water nymphs and wood nymphs, with the qualities of mind and attributes of the body, with sleep and death, old age and pain, strife and victory, with hunger, grief, ridicule, wisdom, deceit, grace, with night and day, the hours, the thunder, the rainbow, in short, all the wonders of nature, all the affections of the soul, and all the qualities of the mind, everything they saw, everything they talked about, everything they felt. All these wonders and sentiments they impersonated, and these impersonations were supposed to preside over the things they represented, and to a certain extent were worshipped. If a man wished the winds to be propitious, he prayed to Zeus. If he wished to be prospered in his bargains, he invoked Hermes. If he wished to be successful in war, he prayed to Ares. He never prayed to a supreme and eternal deity, but to some special manifestation of deity, fancied or real, and hence his religion was essentially pantheistic, though outwardly polytheistic. The divinities whom he invoked he celebrated with rites corresponding with those traits which they represented. Thus, Aphrodite was celebrated with lascivious dances, and Dionysus with drunken revels. Each deity represented the Grecian ideal, of majesty or grace or beauty or strength, or virtue or wisdom or madness or folly. The character of Hera was what the poet supposed should be the attributes of the Queen of Heaven, that of Leto, what should distinguish a disinterested housewife, that of Hestia, what should mark the guardian of the fireside, that of Demeter, what should show supreme benevolence and thrift, that of Athene, what would naturally be associated with wisdom, and that of Aphrodite, what would be expected from a sensual beauty. In the main, Zeus was serene, majestic, and benignant, as became the king of the gods, although he was occasionally faithless to his wife. Poseidon was boisterous, as became the monarch of the seas. Apollo was a devoted son and a bright companion, which one would expect in a gifted poet and wise prophet, beautiful and graceful as a sun-god should be. Hephaestus, the god of fire and smiths, showed naturally the awkwardness to which manual labor leads. Ares was cruel and bloodthirsty, as a god of war should be. Hermes, as the god of trade and business, which would of course be sharp and tricky. And Dionysus, the father of the vine, would naturally become noisy and rollicking in his intoxication. Thus, whatever defects are associated with the principal deities, these are all natural and consistent with the characters they represent, or the duties and business in which they engage. Drunkenness is not associated with Zeus, nor unchastity with Hera or Athene. The poets make each deity consistent with himself and in harmony with the interests he represents. Hence, the mythology of the poets is elaborate and interesting. Who has not devoured the classical dictionary before he has had to learn to scan the lines of Homer or of Virgil? As varied and romantic as the Arabian Nights, it shines in the beauty of nature. In the Grecian creation of gods and goddesses, there is no insult to the understanding, because these creations are in harmony with nature, are consistent with humanity. 
There is no hatred and no love, no jealousy and no fear, which has not a natural cause. The poets proved themselves to be great artists in the very characters they gave to their divinities. They did not aim to excite reverence or to stimulate to duty or point out the higher life, but to amuse a worldly pleasure-seeking, good-natured, joyous, art-loving, poetic people who lived in the present and for themselves alone. End of Section 5 Section 6 of Beacon Lights of History, Volume 1, The Old Pagan Civilizations Beacon Lights of History, Volume 1, The Old Pagan Civilizations, by John Lord Religion of the Greeks and Romans, Part 2 As a future state of rewards and punishments seldom entered into the minds of the Greeks, so the gods are never represented as conferring future salvation. The welfare of the soul was rarely thought of where there was no settled belief in immortality. The gods themselves were fed on nectar and ambrosia, that they might not die like ordinary mortals. They might prolong their own existence indefinitely, but they were impotent to confer eternal life upon their worshippers, and as eternal life is essential to perfect happiness, they could not confer even happiness in its highest sense. On this fact, St. Augustine erected the grand fabric of his theological system. In his most celebrated work, The City of God, he holds up to derision the gods of antiquity, and with blended logic and irony makes them contemptible as objects of worship, since they were impotent to save the soul. In his view, the grand and distinguishing feature of Christianity, in contrast with paganism, is the gift of eternal life and happiness. It is not the morality, which Christ and his apostles taught, which gave to Christianity its immeasurable superiority over all other religions, but the promise of a future felicity in heaven. And it was this promise which gave such comfort to the miserable people of the old pagan world, ground down by oppression, injustice, cruelty, and poverty. It was this promise which filled the converts to Christianity with joy, enthusiasm, and hope. Yea, more than this, even boundless love that salvation was the gift of God through the self-sacrifice of Christ. Immortality was brought to light by the gospel alone, and to miserable people the idea of eternal bliss after the trials of mortal life were past was the source of immeasurable joy. No sooner was this sublime expectation of happiness planted firmly in the minds of pagans than they threw their idols to the moles and the bats. But even in regard to morality, Augustine showed that the gods were no examples to follow. He ridicules their morals and their offices as severely as he points out their impotency to bestow happiness. He shows the absurdity and inconsistency of tolerating players in their delineation of the vices and follies of deities for the amusement of the people in the theater, while the priests performed the same obscenities as religious rites in the temples which were upheld by the state so that philosophers like varro could pour contempt on players with impunity while he dared not ridicule priests for doing in the temples the same things no wonder that the popular religion at last was held in contempt by philosophers since it was not only impotent to save but did not stimulate to ordinary morality to virtue or to lofty sentiments a religion which was held sacred in one place and ridiculed in another before the eyes of the same people could not in the end but yield to what was better if we ascribe to the poets the creation of the elaborate mythology of the Greeks, that is, a system of gods made by men rather than men made by gods, whether as symbols or objects of worship, whether the religion was pantheistic or idolatrous, we find that artists even surpassed the poets in their conceptions of divine power, goodness, and beauty, and thus riveted the chains which the poets forged. The Temple of Zeus at Olympia and Elis where the intellect and the culture of Greece assembled every four years to witness the games instituted in honor of the Father of the Gods, was itself calculated to impose on the senses of the worshippers by its grandeur and beauty. The image of the God himself, sixty feet high, made of ivory, gold, and gems, by the greatest of all the sculptors of antiquity, must have impressed the spectators with the ideas of strength and majesty even more than any poetical descriptions could do. If it was art which the Greeks worshipped rather than an unseen deity who controlled their destinies, and to whom supreme homage was due, how nobly did the image before them represent the highest conceptions of the attributes to be ascribed to the King of Heaven. Seated on his throne, with the emblems of sovereignty in his hands, and attendant deities around him, his head, neck, breast, and arms in massive proportions, and his face expressive of majesty and sweetness, power and repose, benevolence blended with strength, the image of the Olympian deity conveyed to the minds of his worshippers everything that could inspire awe, wonder, and goodness, as well as power. 
no fear was blended with admiration since his favor could be won by the magnificent rites and ceremonies which were instituted in his honor clark alludes to the sculptured apollo belvedere as giving a still more elevated idea of the sun god than the poets themselves a figure expressive of the highest thoughts of the hellenic mind and quotes milman in support of his admiration all all divine no struggling muscle glows through heaving vein no mantling life-blood flows but animate with deity alone in deathless glory lives the breathing stone if a christian poet can see divinity in the chiseled stone why should we wonder at the worship of art by the pagan greeks the same could be said of the statues of artemis of pallas athene of aphrodite and other divine productions of grecian artists since they represented the highest ideal the world has seen of beauty grace loveliness and majesty which the greeks adored hence though the statues of the gods are in human shape it was not men that the greeks worshipped but those qualities of mind and those forms of beauty to which the cultivated intellect instinctively gave the highest praise no one can object to this boundless admiration which the greeks had for art in its highest forms in so far as that admiration became worship it was the divorce of art from morals which called out the indignation and censure of the christian fathers and even undermined the religion of the philosophers so far as it had been directed to the worship of the popular deities which were simply creations of poets and artists it is difficult to conceive how the worship of the gods could have been kept up for so long a time had it not been for the festivals this wise provision for providing interest and recreation for the people was also availed of by the mosaic ritual among the hebrews and has been a part of most well-organized religious systems the festivals were celebrated in honor not merely of deities but of useful inventions of the seasons of the year of great national victories all which were religious in the pagan sense and constituted the highest pleasures of grecian life they were observed with great pomp and splendor in the open air in front of temples in sacred groves wherever the people could conveniently assemble to join in jocund dances in athletic sports and whatever could animate the soul with festivity and joy hence the religious worship of the greeks was cheerful and adapted itself to the tastes and pleasures of the people it was however essentially worldly and sometimes degrading it was similar in its effects to the rural sports of the yeomanry of the middle ages and to the theatrical representations sometimes held in medieval churches certainly to the processions and pomps which the catholic clergy instituted for the amusement of the people hence the sneering but accurate remark of gibbon that all religions were equally true to the people equally false to philosophers and equally useful to rulers the state encouraged and paid for sacrifices rites processions and scenic dances on the same principle that they gave corn to the people to make them contented in their miseries and severely punished those who ridiculed the popular religion when it was performed in temples even though it winked at the ridicule of the same performances in the theatres among the greeks there were no sacred books like the hindu vedas or the hebrew scriptures in which the people could learn duties and religious truths the priests taught nothing they merely officiated at rites and ceremonies it is difficult to find out what were the means and forms of religious instruction so far as pertained to the heart and conscience duties were certainly not learned from the ministers of religion from what source did the people learn the necessity of obedience to parents of conjugal fidelity of truthfulness of chastity of honesty it is difficult to tell the poets and artists taught ideas of beauty of grace of strength and nature in her grandeur and loveliness taught the same things hence a severe taste was cultivated which excluded vulgarity and grossness in the intercourse of life it was the rule to be courteous affable gentlemanly for all this was in harmony with the severity of art the comic poets ridiculed pretension arrogance quackery and lies patriotism which was learned from the dangers of the state amid warlike and unscrupulous neighbors called out many manly virtues like courage fortitude heroism and self-sacrifice a hard and rocky soil necessitated industry thrift and severe punishment on those who stole the fruits of labor even as miners in the rocky mountains sacredly abstain from appropriating the gold of their fellow laborers self-interest and self-preservation dictated many laws which secured the welfare of society the national sacredness of home guarded the virtue of wives and children the natural sense of justice raised indignation against cheating and tricks in trade 
Men and women cannot live together in peace and safety without observing certain conditions, which may be ranked with virtues even among savages and barbarians, much more so in cultivated and refined communities. The graces and amenities of life can exist without reference to future rewards and punishments. The ultimate law of self-preservation will protect men in ordinary times against murder and violence, and will lead to public and social enactments which bad men fear to violate. A traveler ordinarily feels as safe in a highly civilized pagan community as in a Christian city. The heathen Chinese fears the officers of the law as much as does a citizen of London. The great difference between a pagan and a Christian people is in the power of conscience, in the sense of a moral accountability to a spiritual deity, in the hopes or fears of a future state, motives which have a powerful influence on the elevation of individual character and the development of higher types of social organization. But whatever laws are necessary for the maintenance of order, the repression of violence, of crimes against person and the state, and the general material welfare of society, are found in pagan as well as Christian states and the natural affections of paternal and filial love, friendship, patriotism, generosity, etc., while strengthened by Christianity, are also an inalienable part of the God-given heritage of all mankind. We see many heroic traits, many manly virtues, many domestic amenities, and many exalted sentiments in pagan Greece, even if these were not taught by priests or sages. Every man instinctively clings to life, to property, to home, to parents, to wife, and children, and hence these are guarded in every community, and violation of these rights is ever punished with greater or less severity for the sake of general security and public welfare, even if there be no belief in God. Religion, loftily considered, has but little to do with the temporal interests of men. Governments and laws take these under their protection, and it is men who make governments and laws. They are made from the instinct of self-preservation, from patriotic aspirations, from the necessities of civilization. Religion, from the Christian standpoint, is unworldly, having reference to the life which is to come, to the enlightenment of the conscience, to restraint from sins not punishable by the laws, and to the inspiration of virtues which have no worldly reward. This kind of religion was not taught by Grecian priests or poets or artists, and did not exist in Greece, with all its refinement and glories, until partially communicated by those philosophers who meditated on the secrets of nature, the mighty mysteries of life, and the duties which reason and reflection reveal. And it may be noticed that the philosophers themselves, who began with speculations on the origin of the universe, the nature of the gods, the operations of the mind, and the laws of matter, ended at last with ethical inquiries and injunctions. We see this illustrated in Socrates and Zeno. They seemed to despair of finding out God, of explaining the wonders of his universe, and came down to practical life in its sad realities, like Solomon himself when he said, Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. In ethical teachings and inquiries, some of these philosophers reach a height almost equal to that which Christian sages aspired to climb and had the world practiced the virtues which they taught, there would scarcely have been need of a new revelation, so far as the observance of rules to promote happiness on earth is concerned. But these pagan sages did not hold out hopes beyond the grave. They even doubted whether the soul was mortal or immortal. They did teach many ennobling and lofty truths for the enlightenment of thinkers, but they held out no divine help, nor any hope of completing in a future life the failures of this one, and hence they failed in saving society from a persistent degradation, and in elevating ordinary men to those glorious heights reached by the Christian converts. That was the point to which Augustine directed his vast genius and his unrivaled logic. He admitted that arts might civilize, and that the elaborate mythology which he ridiculed was interesting to the people, and was, as a creation of the poets, ingenious and beautiful. But he showed that it did not reveal a future state, that it did not promise eternal happiness, that it did not restrain men from those sins which human laws could not punish, and that it did not exalt the soul to lofty communion with the deity, or kindle a truly spiritual life, and therefore was worthless as a religion, imbecile to save, and only to be classed with those myths which delight an arrogant or sensuous people, and with those rites which are shrouded in mystery and gloom. Nor did he, in his matchless argument against the gods of Greece and Rome, take for his attack those deities whose rites were most degrading and senseless, and which the thinking world despised, but the most lofty forms of pagan religion, such as were accepted by moralists and philosophers like Seneca and Plato. And thus he reached the intelligence of the age, and gave a final blow to all the gods of antiquity. 
it would be instructive to show that the religion of greece as embraced by the people did not prevent or even condemn those social evils that are the greatest blot on enlightened civilization it did not discourage slavery the direst evil which ever afflicted humanity it did not elevate woman to her true position at home or in public it ridiculed those passive virtues that are declared and commended in the sermon on the mount it did not pronounce against the wickedness of war or the vanity of military glory it did not dignify home or the virtues of the family circle it did not declare the folly of riches or show that the love of money is a root of all evil it made sensual pleasure and outward prosperity the great aims of successful ambition and hid with an impenetrable screen from the eyes of men the fatal results of a worldly life so that suicide itself came to be viewed as a justifiable way to avoid evils that are hard to be borne in short it was a religion which though joyous was without hope and with innumerable deities was without god in the world which was no religion at all but a fable a delusion and a superstition as paul argued before the assembled intellect of the most fastidious and cultivated city of the world and yet we see among those who worshipped the gods of greece a sense of dependence on supernatural power and this dependence stands out both in the iliad and the odyssey among the boldest heroes they seem to be reverential to the powers above them however indefinite their views in the best ages of greece the worship of the various deities was sincere and universal and was attended with sacrifices to propitiate favor or avert their displeasure it does not appear that these sacrifices were always offered by priests warriors kings and heroes themselves sacrificed oxen sheep and goats and poured out libations to the gods homer's heroes were very strenuous in the exercise of these duties and they generally traced their calamities and misfortunes to the neglect of sacrifices which was a great offence to the deities from zeus down to inferior gods we read too that the gods were supplicated in fervent prayer there was universally felt in earlier times a need of divine protection if the gods did not confer eternal life they conferred it was supposed temporal and worldly good people prayed for the same blessings that the ancient jews sought from jehovah in this sense early greeks were religious irreverence towards the gods was extremely rare the people however did not pray for divine guidance in the discharge of duty but for the blessings which would give them health and prosperity we seldom see a proud self-reliance even among the heroes of the iliad but great solicitude to secure aid from the deities they worshipped the religion of the romans differed in some respects from that of the greeks inasmuch as it was emphatically a state religion it was more of a ritual and a ceremony it included most of the deities of the greek pantheon but was more comprehensive it accepted the gods of all the nations that composed the empire and placed them in the pantheon even mithra the persian sun god and the isis and osiris of the egyptians to whom sacrifices were made by those who worshipped them at home it was also a purer mythology and rejected many of the blasphemous myths concerning the loves and quarrels of the grecian deities it was more practical and less poetical every roman god had something to do some useful office to perform several divinities presided over the birth and nursing of an infant and they were worshipped for some fancied good for the benefits which they were supposed to bestow there was an elaborate division of labor among them a divinity presided over bakers another over ovens every vocation and every household transaction had its presiding deities there were more superstitious rites practiced by the romans than by the greeks such as examining the entrails of beasts or birds for good and bad omens great attention was given to the dreams and rites of divination the roman household gods were of great account since there was a more defined and general worship of ancestors than among the greeks these were the penates or familiar household gods the guardians of the home whose fire on the sacred hearth was perpetually burning and to whom every meal was esteemed a sacrifice these included a lar or ancestral family divinity in each house there were vestal virgins to guard the most sacred places there was a college of pontiffs to regulate worship and perform the higher ceremonies which were complicated and minute the pontiffs were presided over by one called pontifex maximus a title shrewdly assumed by caesar to gain control of the popular worship and still surviving in the title of the pope of rome with his college of cardinals there were augurs and haruspices to cover the will of the gods according to the entrails and the flight of birds the festivals were more numerous in rome than in greece and perhaps were more piously observed about one day and four was set apart for the worship of particular gods celebrated by feasts and games and sacrifices the principal feast days were in honor of janus the great god of the sabines the god of beginnings celebrated on the first of january to which month he gave his name 
also the feasts in honor of the Penates, of Mars, of Vesta, of Minerva, of Venus, of Ceres, of Juno, of Jupiter, and of Saturn. The Saturnalia, December 19th, in honor of Saturn, the annual Thanksgiving, lasted seven days, when the rich kept open houses and slaves had their liberty, the most joyous of the festivals. The Feast of Minerva lasted five days, when offerings were made by all mechanics, artists, and scholars. The Feast of Sibylle, analogous to that of Ceres in Greece and Isis in Egypt, lasted six days. These various feasts imposed great contributions on the people, and were managed by the pontiffs with the most minute observances and legalities. The principal Roman divinities were the Olympic gods under Latin names like Jupiter, Juno, Mars, Minerva, Neptune, Vesta, Apollo, Venus, Ceres, and Diana. But the secondary deities were almost innumerable. Some of the deities were of Etruscan, some of Sabine, and some of Latin origin, but most of them were imported from Greece or correspond to those of Greek mythology. Many were manufactured by the pontiffs for utilitarian purposes and were mere abstractions, like hope, fear, concord, justice, clemency, etc., to which temples were erected. The powers of nature were also worshipped, like the sun, the moon, and stars. The best side of Roman life was represented in the worship of Vesta, who presided over the household fire and home, and was associated with the Lares and the Penates. Of these household gods, the head of the family was the officiating minister who offered prayers and sacrifices. The Vestal Virgins received a special honor and were appointed by the Pontifex Maximus. Thus the Romans accounted themselves very religious, and doubtless are to be so accounted, certainly in the same sense as were the Athenians by the Apostle Paul, since altars, statues, and temples in honor of gods were everywhere present to the eye, and rites and ceremonies were most systematically and mechanically observed according to strict rules laid down by the pontiffs. They were grave and decorous in their devotions, and seemed anxious to learn from their argors and haruspices the will of the gods, and their funeral ceremonies were held with great pomp and ceremony. As faith in the gods declined, ceremonies and pomps were multiplied, and the ice of ritualism accumulated on the banks of piety. Superstition and unbelief went hand in hand. Worship in the temples was most imposing when the amours and follies of the gods were most ridiculed in the theaters, and as the state was rigorous in its religious observances, hypocrisy became the vice of the most prominent and influential citizens. What sincerity was there in Julius Caesar when he discharged the duties of high priest of the Republic? It was impossible for an educated Roman who read Plato and Zeno to believe in Janus and Juno. It was all very well for the people so to believe, he said, who must be kept in order, but skepticism increased in higher classes until the prevailing atheism culminated in the poetry of Lucretius, who had the boldness to declare that faith in the gods had been the curse of the human race. If the Romans were more devoted to mere external and ritualistic services than the Greeks, more outwardly religious, they were also more hypocritical. If they were not professed freethinkers, for the state did not tolerate opposition or ridicule of those things which it instituted or patronized, Religion had but little practical effect in their lives. The Romans were more immoral, yet more observant of religious ceremonies than the Greeks, who acted and thought as they pleased. Intellectual independence was not one of the characteristics of the Roman citizen. He professed to think as the state prescribed, for the masters of the world were the slaves of the state in religion as in war. The Romans were more gross in their vices, as they were more pharisaical in their profession than the Greeks, whom they conquered and imitated. Neither the sincere worship of ancestors nor the ceremonies and rites which they observed in honor of their innumerable divinities softened the severity of their character or weakened their passion for war and bloody sports. Their hard and rigid wills were rarely moved by the cries of agony or the shrieks of despair. Their slavery was more cruel than among any nation of antiquity. Butchery and legalized murder were the delight of Romans in their conquering days, as were inhuman sports in the days of their political decline. Where was the spirit of religion, as it was even in India and Egypt, when women were debased, when every man and woman held a human being in cruel bondage, when home was abandoned for the circus and the amphitheater, when the cry of the mourner was unheard in shouts of victory, when women sold themselves as wives to those who would pay the highest price, and men abstained from marriage unless they could fatten on rich dowries, when utility was the spring of every action, and demoralizing pleasure was the universal pursuit when feastings and banquets were riotous and expensive, and violence and rapine were restrained only by the strong arm of law dictated by instincts of self-preservation, 
Where was the ennobling influence of the gods, when nobody of any position finally believed in them? How powerless the gods, when the general depravity was so glaring as to call out the terrible invective of Paul, the cosmopolitan traveler, the shrewd observer, the pure-hearted Christian missionary, indicting not a few, but a whole people, who exchanged the truth of God for a lie, and worshipped and served the creature, rather than the creator, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affections, unmerciful. An awful picture, but sustained by the evidence of the Roman writers of that day as certainly no worse than the hideous reality. If this was the outcome of the most exquisitely poetical and art-inspiring mythology the world has ever known, what wonder that the pure spirituality of Jesus the Christ, shining into that blackness of darkness, should have been hailed by perishing millions as the light of the world. Authorities Rawlinson's Religions of the Ancient World Grote's History of Greece Thurwall's History of Greece Homer's Iliad and Odyssey Max Muller's Chips from a German Workshop Curtius's History of Greece Mr. Gladstone's Homer and the Homeric Age Rawlinson's Herodotus, Dollinger's Jew and Gentile, Fenton's Lectures on Ancient and Modern Greece, Smith's Dictionary of Greek and Roman Mythology, Clark's Ten Great Religions, Dwight's Mythology, St. Augustine's City of God. End of Section 6 Section 7 of Beacon Lights of History, Volume 1, The Old Pagan Civilizations Beacon Lights of History, Volume 1, The Old Pagan Civilizations, by John Lord. Confucius, Part 1. Sage and Moralist, 550 to 478 B.C. About 100 years after the great religious movement in India under Buddha, a man was born in China who inaugurated a somewhat similar movement there, and who impressed his character and principles on 300 millions of people. It cannot be said that he was the founder of a new religion, since he aimed only to revive what was ancient. To quote his own words, he was a transmitter, and not a maker. But he was, nevertheless, a very extraordinary character, and if greatness is to be measured by results, I know of no heathen teacher whose work has been so permanent. In genius, in creative power, he was inferior to many, but in influence he has had no equal among the sages of the world. Confucius is a Latin name given him by Jesuit missionaries in China. His real name was Keung Fu Tzu. He was born about 550 BC in the province of Lu, and was the contemporary of Belshazzar of Cyrus, of Croesus, and of Pisistratus. It is claimed that Confucius was a descendant of one of the early emperors of China, of the Chao dynasty, 1121 BC but he was simply of an upper-class family of the state of Lu, one of the provinces of the empire, his father and grandfather having been prime ministers to the reigning princes or dukes of Lu, which state resembled a feudal province of France in the Middle Ages, acknowledging only a nominal fealty to the emperor. We know but little of the early condition of China. The earliest record of events which can be called history takes us back to about 2350 BC, when Yao was emperor an intelligent and benignant prince, uniting under his sway the different states of China, which had even then reached a considerable civilization, for the legendary or mythical history of the country dates back about 5,000 years. Yao's son Shun was an equally remarkable man, wise and accomplished, who lived only to advance the happiness of his subjects. At that period the religion of China was probably monotheistic. The supreme being was called Shang Te, to whom sacrifices were made, a deity who exercised a superintending care of the universe, but corruptions rapidly crept in, and a worship of the powers of nature and of the spirits of departed ancestors, who were supposed to guard the welfare of their descendants, became the prevailing religion. During the reigns of these good emperors, the standard of morality was high throughout the empire. But morals declined the old story, in all the states of the ancient world. 
in addition to the decline in morals there were political discords and endless wars between the petty princes of the empire to remedy the political and moral evils of his time was the great desire and endeavor of confucius the most marked feature in the religion of the chinese before his time was the worship of ancestors and this worship he did not seek to change confucius taught three thousand disciples of whom the more eminent became influential authors like plato and xenophon they recorded the sayings of their master and his maxims and arguments preserved in their works were afterward added to the national collection of the sacred books called the nim classes confucius was a mere boy when his father died and we know next to nothing of his early years at fifteen years of age however we are told that he devoted himself to learning pursuing his studies under considerable difficulties his family being poor he married when he was nineteen years of age and in the following year was born his son li his only child of whose descendants eleven thousand males were living one hundred and fifty years ago constituting the only hereditary nobility of china a class who for seventy generations were the recipients of the highest honors and privileges on the birth of li the duke chao of lu sent confucius a present of a carp which seems to indicate that he was already distinguished for his attainments at twenty years of age confucius entered upon political duties being the superintendent of cattle from which for his fidelity and ability he was promoted to the higher office of distributor of grain having attracted the attention of his sovereign at twenty-two he began his labors as a public teacher and his house became the resort of enthusiastic youth who wished to learn the doctrines of antiquity these were all that the sage undertook to teach not new and original doctrines of morality or political economy but only such as were established from a remote antiquity going back two thousand years before he was born there is no improbability in this alleged antiquity of the chinese empire for egypt at this time was a flourishing state at twenty-nine years of age confucius gave his attention to music which he studied under a famous master and to this art he devoted no small part of his life writing books and treatises upon it six years afterward at thirty-five he had a great desire to travel and the reigning duke in whose service he was as a high officer of state put at his disposal a carriage and two horses to visit the court of the emperor whose sovereignty however was only nominal it does not appear that confucius was received with much distinction nor did he have much intercourse with the court or the ministers he was a mere seeker of knowledge an inquirer about the ceremonies and maxims of the founder of the dynasty of chow an observer of customs like herodotus he wandered for eight years among the various provinces of china teaching as he went but without making a great impression moreover he was regarded with jealousy by the different ministers of princes one of them however struck with his wisdom and knowledge wished to retain him in his service on the return of confucius to lu he remained fifteen years without official employment his native province being in a state of anarchy but he was better employed than in serving princes prosecuting his researches into poetry history ceremonies and music a born scholar with an insatiable desire of knowledge his great gifts and learning however did not allow him to remain without public employment he was made governor of an important city as chief magistrate of this city he made a marvelous change in the manners of the people the duke surprised at what he saw asked if his rules could be employed to govern a whole state and confucius told him that they could be applied to the government of the empire on this the duke appointed him assistant superintendent of public works a great office held only by members of the ducal family so many improvements did confucius make in agriculture that he was made minister of justice and so wonderful was his management that soon there was no necessity to put the penal laws in execution since no offenders could be found confucius held his high office as minister of justice for two years longer and some suppose he was made prime minister his authority certainly continued to increase he exalted the sovereign depressed the ministers and weakened private families just as richelieu did in france strengthening the throne at the expense of the nobility it would thus seem that his political reforms were in the direction of absolute monarchy a needed force in times of anarchy and demoralization so great was his fame as a statesman that strangers came from other states to see him 
these reforms in the state of Lu gave annoyance to the neighboring princes and to undermine the influence of confucius with the duke these princes set the duke a present of eighty beautiful girls possessing musical and dancing accomplishments and also one hundred and twenty splendid horses as the duke soon came to think more of his girls and horses than of his reforms confucius became disgusted resigned his office and retired to private life then followed thirteen years of homeless wandering he was now fifty-six years of age depressed and melancholy in view of his failure with princes he was accompanied in his travels by some of his favorite disciples to whom he communicated his wisdom but his fame preceded him wherever he journeyed and such was the respect for his character and teachings that he was loaded with presents by the people and was left unmolested to do as he pleased the dissoluteness of courts filled him with indignation and disgust and he was heard to exclaim on one occasion i have not seen one who loves virtue as he loves beauty meaning the beauty of women the love of the beautiful in an artistic sense is a greek and not an oriental idea in the meantime confucius continued his wanderings from city to city and state to state with a chosen band of disciples all of whom became famous he traveled for the pursuit of knowledge and to impress the people with his doctrines a certain one of his followers was questioned by a prince as to the merits and peculiarities of his master but was afraid to give a true answer the sage hearing of it said you should have told him he is simply a man who in his eager pursuit of knowledge forgets his food who in the joy of his attainments forgets his sorrows and who does not perceive that old age is coming on how seldom is it that any man reaches such a height in a single sentence the philosopher describes himself truly and impressively at last in the year 491 bc a new sovereign reigned in lu and with costly presents invited confucius to return to his native state the philosopher was now sixty-nine years of age and notwithstanding the respect in which he was held the world cannot be said to have dealt kindly with him it is the fate of prophets and sages to be rejected the world will not bear rebukes even a friend if discreet will rarely venture to tell another friend his faults confucius told the truth when pressed but he does not seem to have courted martyrdom and his manners and speech were too bland too proper too unobtrusive to give much offence luther was aided in his reforms by his very roughness and boldness but he was surrounded by a different class of people from those whom confucius sought to influence conventional polite considerate and a great respecter of persons and authority was the chinese sage a rude abrupt and fierce reformer would have had no weight with the most courteous and polite people of whom history speaks whose manners twenty five hundred years ago were substantially the same as they are at the present day a people governed by the laws of propriety alone the few remaining years of confucius's life were spent in revising his writings but his latter days were made melancholy by dwelling on the evils of the world that he could not remove disappointment also had made him cynical and bitter like solomon of old although from different causes he survived his son and his most beloved disciples as he approached the dark valley he uttered no prayer and betrayed no apprehension death to him was a rest he died at the age of seventy-three in the tenth book of his analects we get a glimpse of the habits of the philosopher he was a man of rule and ceremony he was particular about his dress and appearance he was no ascetic but moderate and temperate he lived chiefly on rice like the rest of his countrymen but required to have his rice cooked nicely and his meat cut properly he drank wine freely but was never known to have obscured his faculties by this indulgence i do not read that tea was then in use he was charitable and hospitable but not ostentatious he generally traveled in a carriage with two horses driven by one of his disciples but a carriage in those days was like one of our carts in his village it is said he looked simple and sincere as if he were one not able to speak when waiting at court or speaking with officers of an inferior grade he spoke freely but in a straightforward manner with officers of a higher grade he spoke blandly but precisely with the prince he was grave but self-possessed when eating he did not converse when in bed he did not speak if his mat were not straight he did not sit on it when a friend sent him a present he did not bow the only present for which he bowed was that of the flesh of sacrifice he was capable of excessive grief with all his placidity when his favorite pupil died he exclaimed heaven is destroying me 
his disciples on this said sir your grief is excessive it is excessive he replied if i am not to mourn bitterly for this man for whom shall i mourn the reigning prince of lu caused a temple to be erected over the remains of confucius and the number of his disciples continually increased the emperors of the falling dynasty of chow had neither the intelligence nor the will to do honor to the departed philosopher but the emperors of the succeeding dynasties did all they could to perpetuate his memory during his life confucius found ready acceptance for his doctrines and was everywhere revered among the people though not uniformly appreciated by the rulers nor able permanently to establish the reforms he inaugurated after his death however no honor was too great to be rendered him the most splendid temple in china was built over his grave and he received a homage little removed from worship his writings became a sacred rule of faith and practice schools were based upon them and scholars devoted themselves to their interpretation for two thousand years confucius has reigned supreme the undisputed teacher of a population of three or four hundred millions confucius must be regarded as a man of great humility conscious of infirmities and faults but striving after virtue and perfection he said of himself i have striven to become a man of perfect virtue and to teach others without weariness but the character of the superior man carrying out in his conduct what he professes is what i have not attained to i am not one born in the possession of knowledge but i am one who is fond of antiquity and earnest in seeking it there i am a transmitter and not a maker if he did not lay claim to divine illumination he felt that he was born into the world for a special purpose not to declare new truths not to initiate any new ceremony but to confirm what he felt was in danger of being lost the most conservative of all known reformers confucius left behind voluminous writings of which his analects his book of poetry his book of history and his rules of propriety are the most important it is these which are now taught and have been taught for two thousand years in the schools and colleges of china the chinese think that no man so great and perfect as he has ever lived his writings are held in the same veneration that Christians attach to their own sacred literature. There is this one fundamental difference between the authors of the Bible and the Chinese sage, that he did not like to talk of spiritual things. Indeed, of them he was ignorant, professing no interest in relation to the working out of abstruse questions, either of philosophy or theology. He had no taste or capacity for such inquiries. Hence, he did not aspire to throw any new light on the great problems of human condition and destiny, nor did he speculate, like the Ionian philosophers, on the creation or end of things. He was not troubled about the origin or destiny of man. He meddled neither with physics nor metaphysics, but he earnestly and consistently strove to bring to light and to enforce those principles which had made remote generations wise and virtuous. He confined his attention to outward phenomena, to the world of sense and matter, to forms, precedents, ceremonies, proprieties, rules of conduct, filial duties, and duties to the state, enjoining temperance, honesty, and sincerity as the cardinal and fundamental laws of private and national prosperity. He was no prophet of wrath, though living in a corrupt age. He utters no anathemas on princes, and no woes on peoples nor does he glow with exalted hopes of a millennium of bliss or of the beatitudes of a future state he was not stern and indignant like elijah but more like the courtier and counselor elisha he was a man of the world and all his teachings have reference to respectability in the world's regard he doubted more than he believed and yet in many of his sayings confucius rises to an exalted height considering his age and circumstances some of them remind us of some of the best proverbs of solomon in general we should say that to his mind filial piety and fraternal submission were the foundation of all virtuous practices and absolute obedience to rulers the primal principle of government he was eminently a peace man discouraging wars and violence he was liberal and tolerant in his views he said that the superior man is catholic and no partisan duke gay asked what should be done to secure the submission of the people the sage replied advance the upright and set aside the crooked then the people will submit but advance the crooked and set aside the upright and the people will not submit again he said it is virtuous manners which constitute the excellence of a neighborhood 
therefore fix your residence where virtuous manners prevail the following sayings remind me of epictetus a scholar whose mind is set on truth and who is ashamed of bad clothes and bad food is not fit to be discoursed with a man should say i am not concerned that i have no place i am concerned how i may fit myself for one i am not concerned that i am not known i seek to be worthy to be known here confucius looks to the essence of things not to popular desires in the following on the other hand he shows his prudence and policy in serving a prince frequent remonstrances lead to disgrace between friends frequent reproofs make the friendship distant thus he talks like solomon say you one of his disciples being asleep in the daytime the master said rotten wood cannot be carved this you what is the use of my reproving him of a virtuous prince he said in his conduct of himself he was humble in serving his superiors he was respectful in nourishing the people he was kind in ordering the people he was just it was discussed among his followers what it is to be distinguished one said it is to be heard of through the family and state the master replied that is notoriety not distinction again he said though a man may be able to recite three hundred odes yet if when entrusted with office he does not know how to act of what practical use is his poetical knowledge again if a minister cannot rectify himself what has he to do with rectifying others there is great force in this saying the superior man is easy to serve and difficult to please since you cannot please him in any way which is not accordant with right but the mean man is difficult to serve and easy to please the superior man has a dignified ease without pride the mean man has pride without a dignified ease a disciple asked him what qualities a man must possess to entitle him to be called a scholar the master said he must be earnest urgent and bland among his friends earnest and urgent among his brethren bland and the scholar who cherishes a love of comfort is not fit to be deemed a scholar if a man he said take no thought about what is distant he will find sorrow near at hand and again he who requires much from himself and little from others he will keep himself from being an object of resentment these proverbs remind us of bacon specious words confound virtue want of forbearance in small matters confound great plains virtue the master said is more to man than either fire or water i have seen men die from treading on water or fire but i have never seen a man die from treading the course of virtue this is a lofty sentiment but i think it is not in accordance with the records of martyrdom there are three things he continued which the superior man guards against in youth he guards against his passions in manhood against quarrelsomeness and in old age against covetousness i do not find anything in the sayings of confucius that can be called cynical such as we find in some of the proverbs of solomon even in reference to women where women were as in most oriental countries despised the most that approaches cynicism is in such a remark as this i have not yet seen one who could perceive his faults and inwardly accuse himself his definition of perfect virtue is above that of paley the man of virtue makes the difficulty to be overcome his first business and success only a secondary consideration throughout his writings there is no praise of success without virtue and no disparagement of want of success with virtue nor have i found in his sayings a sentiment which may be called demoralizing he always takes the higher ground and with all his ceremony ever exalts inward purity above all external appearances there is a quaint common sense in some of his writings which reminds me of the sayings of abraham lincoln for instance one of his disciples asked if you had the conduct of armies whom would you like to have act with you the master replied i would not have him to act with me who will unarmed attack a tiger or cross a river without a boat here something like wit and irony break out a man of the village says great is kyung the philosopher his learning is extensive and yet he does not render his name famous by any particular thing the master heard this observation and said to his disciples what shall i practice charioteering or archery i will practice charioteering when the duke of lu asked about government the master said good government exists when those who are near are made happy and when those who are far off are attracted 
when the duke questioned him again on the same subject he replied go before the people with your example and be laborious in their affairs pardon small faults and raise to office men of virtue and talents but how shall i know the men of virtue asked the duke raise to office those whom you do know the key to his political philosophy seems to be this a man who knows how to govern himself knows how to govern others and he who knows how to govern other men knows how to govern an empire the art of government he said is to keep its affairs before the mind without weariness and to practice them with undeviating constancy to govern means to rectify if you lead on the people with correctness who will not dare to be correct this is one of his favorite principles namely the force of a good example as when the reigning prince asked him how to do away with thieves he replied if you sir were not covetous although you should reward them to do it they would not steal this was not intended as a rebuke to the prince but an illustration of the force of a great example confucius rarely openly rebuked any one especially a prince whom it was his duty to venerate for his office he contented himself with enforcing principles here his moderation and great courtesy are seen end of section seven section eight of beacon lights of history volume one the old pagan civilizations beacon lights of history volume one the old pagan civilizations by john lord confucius part two confucius sometimes soared to the highest morality known to the pagan world chung kung asked about perfect virtue the master said it is when you go abroad to behave to everyone as if you were receiving a great guest to have no murmuring against you in the country and family and not to do to others as you would not wish done to yourself the superior man has neither anxiety nor fear let him never fail reverentially to order his own conduct and let him be respectful to others and observant of propriety then all within the four seas will be brothers hold faithfulness and sincerity as first principles and be moving continually to what is right fan chi asked about benevolence the master said it is to love all men another asked about friendship confucius replied faithfully admonish your friend and kindly try to lead him if you find him impracticable stop do not disgrace yourself this saying reminds us of that of our great master cast not your pearls before swine there is no greater folly than in making oneself disagreeable without any probability of reformation someone asked what do you say about the treatment of injuries the master answered recompense injury with justice and recompense kindness with kindness here again he was not far from the greater teacher on the mount when a man's knowledge is sufficient to attain and his virtue is not sufficient to hold whatever he may have gained he will lose again one of the favorite doctrines of confucius was the superiority of the ancients to the men of his day said he the high-mindedness of antiquity showed itself in a disregard of small things that of the present day shows itself in license the stern dignity of antiquity showed itself in grave reserve that of the present shows itself in quarrelsome perverseness the policy of antiquity showed itself in straightforwardness that of the present in deceit the following is a saying worthy of montaigne of all people girls and servants are the most difficult to behave to if you are familiar with them they lose their humility if you maintain reserve to them they are discontented such are some of the sayings of confucius on account of which he was regarded as the wisest of his countrymen and as his conduct was in harmony with his principles he was justly revered as a pattern of morality the greatest virtues which he enjoined were sincerity truthfulness and obedience to duty whatever may be the sacrifice to do right because it is right and not because it is expedient filial piety extending to absolute reverence and an equal reverence for rulers he had no theology he confounded god with heaven and earth he says nothing about divine providence he believed in nothing supernatural he thought little and said less about a future state of rewards and punishments his morality was elevated but not supernal we infer from his writings that his age was degenerate and corrupt but as we have already said his reproofs were gentle blandness of speech and manners was his distinguishing outward peculiarity and this seems to characterize his nation whether learned from him or whether an inborn national peculiarity i do not know 
He went through great trials most creditably, but he was no martyr. He constantly complained that his teachings fell on listless ears, which made him sad and discouraged, but he never flagged in his labors to improve his generation. He had no egotism, but great self-respect, reminding us of Michelangelo. He was humble, but full of dignity, serene though distressed, cheerful but not hilarious. Were he to live among us now, we should call him a perfect gentleman, with aristocratic sympathies, but more autocratic in his views of government and society than aristocratic. He seems to have loved the people, and was kind, even respectful, to everybody. When he visited a school, it is said that he arose in quiet deference to speak to the children, since some of the boys he thought would probably be distinguished and powerful at no distant day. He was also remarkably charitable, and put a greater value on virtues and abilities than upon riches and honors. Though courted by princes, he would not serve them in violation of his self-respect, asked no favors, and returned their presence. If he did not live above the world, he adorned the world. We cannot compare his teachings with those of Christ. They are immeasurably inferior in loftiness and spirituality, but they are worldly wise and decorous, and are on an equality with those of Solomon in moral wisdom. They are wonderfully adapted to a people who are conservative of their institutions and who have more respect for tradition than for progress. The worship of ancestors is closely connected with veneration for parental authority, and with absolute obedience to parents is allied absolute obedience to the emperor as head of the state. Hence the writings of Confucius have tended to cement the Chinese imperial power, in which fact we may perhaps find the secret of his extraordinary posthumous influence. No wonder that emperors and rulers have revered and honored his memory, and used the power of the state to establish his doctrines. Moreover, his exaltation of learning as a necessity for rulers has tended to put all the offices of the realm into the hands of scholars. There was never a country where scholars have been and still are so generally employed by the government. And as men of learning are conservative in their sympathies, so they generally are fond of peace and detest war. Hence, under the influence of scholars, the policy of the Chinese government has always been mild and pacific. It is even paternal. It has more similarity to the governments of a remote antiquity than that of any existing nation. Thus is the influence of Confucius seen in the stability of government and of conservative institutions, as well as in decency in the affairs of life and gentleness and courtesy of manners. Above all is his influence seen in the employment of men of learning and character in the affairs of state and in all the offices of government, as the truest guardians of whatever tends to exalt a state and make it respectable and stable, if not powerful for war or daring in deeds of violence. Confucius was essentially a statesman as well as a moralist, but his political career was an apparent failure, since few princes listened to his instructions. Yet if he was lost to his contemporaries, he has been preserved by posterity. Perhaps there never lived a man so worshipped by posterity, who had so slight a following by the men of his own time, unless we liken him to that greatest of all prophets, who, being despised and rejected, is and is to be the headstone of the corner, in the rebuilding of humanity. Confucius says so little about the subjects that interested the people of China, that some suppose he had no religion at all. Nor did he mention but once in his writings Shang-Ti, the supreme deity of his remote ancestors, and he deduced nothing from the worship of him. And yet there are expressions in his sayings which seem to show that he believed in a supreme power. He often spoke of heaven and loved to walk in the heavenly way. Heaven to him was destiny, by the power of which the world was created. By heaven the virtuous are rewarded and the guilty are punished. Out of love for the people, heaven appoints rulers to protect and instruct them. Prayer is unnecessary because heaven does not actively interfere with the soul of man. Confucius was philosophical and consistent in all pervading principle by which he insisted upon the common source of power in government, of the state, of the family, and of oneself. Self-knowledge and self-control he maintained to be the fountain of all personal virtue and attainment in performance of the moral duties owed to others, whether above or below in social standing. He supposed all men are born equally good, but that the temptations of the world at length destroy the original rectitude. The superior man, who next to the sage holds the highest place in the Confucian humanity, conquers the evil in the world, though subject to infirmities, his acts are guided by the laws of propriety, and are marked by strict sincerity. 
confucius admitted that he himself had failed to reach the level of the superior man this admission may have been the result of his extraordinary humility and modesty in the great learning confucius lays down the rules to enable one to become a superior man the foundation of his rules is in the investigation of things or knowledge with which virtue is indissolubly connected as in the ethics of socrates he maintained that no attainment can be made and no virtue can remain untainted without learning without this benevolence becomes folly sincerity recklessness straightforwardness rudeness and firmness foolishness but mere accumulation of the facts was not knowledge for learning without thought is labor lost and thought without learning is perilous complete wisdom was to be found only among the ancient sages by no mental endeavor could any man hope to equal the supreme wisdom of yao and of shun the object of learning he said should be the truth and the combination of learning with a firm will will surely lead a man to virtue virtue must be free from all hypocrisy and guile the next step towards perfection is the cultivation of the person which must begin with introspection and ends in harmonious outward expression every man must guard his thoughts words and actions and conduct must agree with words by words the superior man directs others but in order to do this his words must be sincere it by no means follows however that virtue is the invariable concomitant of plausible speech the height of virtue is filial piety for this is connected indissolubly with loyalty to the sovereign who is the father of his people and the preserver of the state loyalty to the sovereign is synonymous with duty and is outwardly shown by obedience next to parents all superiors should be the object of reverence this reverence it is true should be reciprocal a sovereign forfeits all right to reverence and obedience when he ceases to be a minister of good but then only the man who has developed virtues in himself is considered competent to rule a family or a state for the same virtues which enable a man to rule the one will enable him to rule the other no man can teach others who cannot teach his own family the greatest stress as we have seen is laid by confucius on filial piety which consists in obedience to authority in serving parents according to propriety that is with the deepest affection and the father of the state with loyalty but while it is incumbent on a son to obey the wishes of his parents it is also a part of his duty to remonstrate with them should they act contrary to the rules of propriety all remonstrances however must be made humbly should these remonstrances fail the son must mourn in silence the obduracy of the parents he carries the obligations of filial piety so far as to teach that a son should conceal the immorality of a father forgetting the distinction of right and wrong brotherly love is the sequel of filial piety happy says he is the union with wife and children it is like the music of lutes and harps the love which binds brother to brother is second only to that which is due from children to parents it consists in mutual friendship joyful harmony and dutiful obedience on the part of the younger to the elder brothers while obedience is exacted to an elder brother and to parents confucius said but little respecting the ties which should bind husband and wife he had but little respect for woman and was divorced from his wife after living with her for a year he looked on women as every way inferior to men and only to be endured as necessary evils it was not until a woman became a mother that she was treated with respect in china hence according to confucius the great object of marriage is to increase the family especially to give birth to sons women could be lawfully and properly divorced who had no children which put women completely in the power of men and reduced them to the condition of slaves the failure to recognize the sanctity of marriage is the great blot on the system of confucius as a scheme of morals but the sage exalts friendship everybody from the emperor downward must have friends and the best friends are those allied by ties of blood friends said he are wealth to the poor strength to the weak and medicine to the sick one of the strongest bonds to friendship is literature and literary exertion men are enjoined by confucius to make friends among the most virtuous of scholars even as they are enjoined to take service under the most worthy of great officers in the intercourse of friends the most unbounded sincerity and frankness is imperatively enjoined he who is not trusted by his friends will not gain the confidence of the sovereign and he who is not obedient to parents will not be trusted by friends everything is subordinated to the state but on the other hand the family friends culture virtue the good of the people is the main object of good government no virtue 
said Emperor Ku, 2435 B.C., is higher than to love all men, and there is no loftier aim in government than to profit all men. When he was asked what should be done for the people, he replied, enrich them. And when asked what more should be done, he replied, teach them. On these two principles the whole philosophy of the sage rested, the temporal welfare of the people and their education. He laid great stress on knowledge as leading to virtue, and on virtue as leading to prosperity. He made the profession of a teacher the most honorable calling to which a citizen could aspire. He himself was a teacher. All sages are teachers, though all teachers are not sages. Confucius enlarged upon the necessity of having good men in office. The officials of his day excited his contempt and reciprocally scorned his teachings. It was in contrast to these officials that he painted the ideal times of Kings Wan and Wu. The two motive powers of government, according to Confucius, are righteousness and the observance of ceremonies. Righteousness is the law of the world, as ceremonies form a rule to the heart. What he meant by ceremonies was rules of propriety, intended to keep all unruly passions in check, and produce a reverential manner among all classes. Doubtless he overestimated the force of example, since there are men in every country and community who will be lawless and reckless, in spite of the best models of character and conduct. The ruling desire of Confucius was to make the whole empire peaceful and happy. The welfare of the people, the right government of the state, and the prosperity of the empire were the main objects of his solicitude. As conducive to these, he touched on many other things incidentally, such as the encouragement of music, of which he was very fond. He himself summed up the outcome of his rules for conduct in this prohibitive form, Do not unto others that which you would not have them do to you. Here we have the negative side of the positive golden rule. Reciprocity, and that alone, was his law of life. He does not inculcate forgiveness of inquiries, but exacts a tooth for a tooth and an eye for an eye. As to his own personal character, it was nearly faultless. His humility and patience were alike remarkable, and his sincerity and candor were as marked as his humility. He was the most learned man in the empire, yet lamented the deficiency of his knowledge. He even disclaimed the qualities of the superior man, much more those of the sage. I am, said he, not virtuous enough to be free from cares, nor wise enough to be free from anxieties, nor bold enough to be free from fear. He was always ready to serve his sovereign or the state, but he neither grasped office, nor put forward his own merits, nor sought to advance his own interests. He was grave, generous, tolerant, and sincere. He carried into practice all the rules he taught. Poverty was his lot in life, but he never repined at the absence of wealth nor lost the severe dignity which is ever to be associated with wisdom and the force of personal character. Indeed, his greatness was in his character, rather than in his genius, and yet I think his genius has been underrated. His greatness is seen in the profound devotion of his followers to him, however lofty their merits or exalted their rank. No one ever disputed his influence and fame, and his moral excellence shines all the brighter in view of the troublous times in which he lived, when warriors occupied the stage, and men of letters were driven behind the scenes. The literary labors of Confucius were very great, since he made the whole classical literature of China accessible to his countrymen. The fame of all preceding writers is merged in his own renown. His works have had the highest authority for more than two thousand years. They have been regarded as the exponents of supreme wisdom, and adopted as textbooks by all scholars and in all schools in that vast empire, which includes one-fourth of the human race. To all educated men, the book of changes, Yin King, the book of poetry, Shi King, the book of history, Shu King, the book of rites, Li King, the great learning, Ta Heo, showing the parental essence of all government, and the doctrine of the mean, Chung Yung, teaching the golden mean of conduct, and the Confucian Analects, Lun Yu, recording his conversations, are supreme authorities, to which must be added the works of Mencius, the greatest of his disciples. There is no record of any books that have exacted such supreme reverence in any nation as the works of Confucius, except the Quran of the Mohammedans, the Book of Law among the Hebrews, and the Bible among the Christians. What an influence for one man to have exerted on subsequent ages, who laid no claim to divinity or even originality, recognized as a man, worshipped as a god. No sooner had the son of Confucius set under a cloud, since sovereigns and princes had neglected if they had not scorned his precepts, 
then his memory and principles were duly honored. But it was not until the accession of the Han dynasty, 206 BC, that the reigning emperor collected the scattered writings of the sage and exerted his vast power to secure the study of them throughout the schools of China. It must be borne in mind that a hostile emperor of the preceding dynasty had ordered the books of Confucius to be burned, but they were secreted by his faithful admirers in the walls of houses and beneath the ground. Succeeding emperors heaped additional honors on the memory of the sage, and in the early part of the 16th century, an emperor of the Ming dynasty gave him the title which he at present bears in China, the perfect sage, the ancient teacher, Confucius. No higher title could be conferred upon him in a land where to be ancient is to be revered. For more than 1,200 years, temples have been erected in his honor, and his worship has been universal throughout the empire. His maxims of morality have appealed to human consciousness in every succeeding generation, and carry as much weight today as they did when the Han Dynasty made them the standard of human wisdom. They were especially adapted to the Chinese intellect, which, although shrewd and ingenious, is phlegmatic, unspeculative, matter-of-fact, and unspiritual. Moreover, as we have said, it was to the interest of rulers to support his doctrines, from the constant exhortations to loyalty which Confucius enjoined. And yet there is in his precepts a democratic influence also, since he recognized no other titles or ranks but such as are won by personal merit, thus opening every office in the state to the learned whatever their original social rank. The great political truth that the welfare of the people is the first duty and highest aim of rulers has endeared the memory of the sage to the unnumbered millions who toil upon the scantiest means of subsistence that have been known in any nation's history. This essay on the religion of the Chinese would be incomplete without some allusion to one of the contemporaries of Confucius, who spiritually and intellectually was probably his superior, and to whom even Confucius paid extraordinary deference. This man was called Lao Tse, a recluse and philosopher, who was already an old man when Confucius began his travels. He was the founder of Tao Tse, a kind of rationalism, which at present has millions of adherents in China. This old philosopher did not receive Confucius very graciously, since the younger man declared nothing new, only wishing to revive the teachings of ancient sages, while he himself was a great awakener of thought. He was, like Confucius, a politico-ethical teacher, but unlike him, sought to lead people back to a state of primitive society before forms and regulations existed. He held that man's nature was good, and that primitive pleasures and virtues were better than worldly wisdom. He maintained that spiritual weapons cannot be formed by laws and regulations, and that prohibiting enactments tended to increase the evils they were meant to avert. While this great and profound man was in some respects superior to Confucius, his influence has been most seen on the inferior people of China. Taoism rivals Buddhism as the religion of the lower classes, and Taoism combined with Buddhism has more adherence than Confucianism. But the wise, the mighty, and the noble still cling to Confucius as the greatest man whom China has produced. Of spiritual religion, indeed, the lower millions of Chinese have now but little conception. Their nearest approach to any supernaturalism is the worship of deceased ancestors, and their religious observances are the grossest formalism. But as a practical system of morals in the days of its earliest establishment, the religion of Confucius ranks very high among the best developments of paganism. Certainly no man ever had a deeper knowledge of his countrymen than he, or adapted his doctrines to the peculiar needs of their social organism with such amazing tact. It is a remarkable thing that all the religions of antiquity have practically passed away with their cities and empires, except among the Hindus and Chinese, and it is doubtful if these religions can withstand the changes which foreign conquest and Christian missionary enterprise and civilization are producing. In the East, the old religions gave place to Mohammedanism, as in the West, they disappeared before the power of Christianity. And these conquering religions retain and extend their hold upon the human mind and human affections by reason of their fundamental principles, the fatherhood of a personal God and the brotherhood of universal man. With the ideas prevalent among all sects, that God is not only supreme in power but benevolent in his providence, and that every man has claims and rights which cannot be set aside by kings or rulers or priests, nations must indefinitely advance in virtue and happiness as they receive and live by the inspiration of this elevating faith. Authorities Religion in China by Joseph Edkins, D.D. Rawlinson's Religions of the Ancient World, 
Freeman Clark's Ten Great Religions, Johnson's Oriental Religions, Davis's Chinese, Nevin's China and the Chinese, Giles's Chinese Sketches, Lenormand's Ancient History of the East, Hughes' Christianity in China, Lega's Prologamena to the Shu King, Lecomte's China, Dr. S. Wells Williams's Middle Kingdom, China by Professor Douglas, The Religions of China by James Lega. End of Section 8 Section 9 of Beacon Lights of History, Volume 1, The Old Pagan Civilizations Beacon Lights of History, Volume 1, The Old Pagan Civilizations by John Lord Ancient Philosophy, Part 1 Seeking After Truth Whatever may be said of the inferiority of the ancients to the moderns in natural and mechanical science, which no one is disposed to question, or even in the realm of literature, which may be questioned, there was one department of knowledge to which we have added nothing of consequence. In the realm of art they were our equals, and probably our superiors. In philosophy they carried logical deduction to its utmost limit. They advanced from a few crude speculations on material phenomena to an analysis of all the powers of the mind, and finally to the establishment of ethical principles which even Christianity did not supersede. The progress of philosophy, from Thales to Plato, is the most stupendous triumph of the human intellect. The reason of man soared to the loftiest flights that it has ever attained. It cast its searching eye into the most abstruse inquiries which ever tasked the famous minds of the world. It exhausted all the subjects which dialectical subtlety ever raised. It originated and carried out the boldest speculations respecting the nature of the soul and its future existence. It established important psychological truths and created a method for the solution of abstruse questions. It went on from point to point until all the faculties of the mind were severely analyzed and all its operations were subjected to a rigid method. The Romans never added a single principle to the philosophy which the Greeks elaborated. The ingenious scholastics of the Middle Ages merely reproduced Greek ideas, and even the profound and patient Germans have gone round in the same circles that Plato and Aristotle marked out more than 2,000 years ago. Only the Brahmins of India have equaled them in intellectual subtlety and acumen. It was Greek philosophy in which noble Roman youths were educated, and hence, as it was expounded by a Cicero, a Marcus Aurelius, and an Epictetus, it was as much the inheritance of the Romans as it was of the Greeks themselves, after Grecian liberties were swept away and Greek cities became a part of the Roman Empire. The Romans learned what the Greeks created and taught, and philosophy, as well as art, became identified with the civilization which extended from the Rhine and the Po to the Nile and the Tigris. Greek philosophy was one of the distinctive features of ancient civilization long after the Greeks had ceased to speculate on the laws of mind or the nature of the soul, on the existence of God, or future rewards and punishments. Although it was purely Grecian in its origin and development, it became one of the grand ornaments of the Roman schools. The Romans did not originate medicine, but Galen was one of its greatest lights. They did not invent the hexameter verse, but Virgil sang to its measure. They did not create Ionic capitals, but their cities were ornamented with marble temples on the same principles as those which called out the admirations of Pericles. So if they did not originate philosophy, and generally had but little taste for it, still its truths were systematized and explained by Cicero, and formed no small accession to the treasures with which cultivated intellects sought everywhere to be enriched. It formed an essential part of the intellectual wealth of the civilized world, when civilization could not prevent the world from falling into decay and ruin. And as it was the noblest triumph which the human mind, under pagan influences, ever achieved, so it was followed by the most degrading imbecility into which man, in civilized countries, was ever allowed to fall. Philosophy, like art, like literature, like science, arose, shone, grew dim, and passed away, leaving the world in night. Why was so bright a glory followed by so dismal a shame? What a comment is this on the greatness and littleness of man? In all probability, the development of Greek philosophy originated with the Ionian Sophoi, 
though many suppose it was derived from the east it is questionable whether the oriental nations had any philosophy distinct from religion the germans are fond of tracing resemblances in the early speculations of the greeks to the systems which prevailed in asia from a very remote antiquity gladish sees in the pythagorean system an adoption of chinese doctrines in the heraclitic system the influence of persia in the empedoclean egyptian speculations and in the anaxagorean the jewish creeds but the orientals had theogenies not philosophies the indian speculations aim at an exposition of ancient revelation they profess to liberate the soul from the evils of mortal life and to arrive at eternal beatitudes but the state of perfectibility could be reached only by religious ceremonial observances and devout contemplation the indian systems do not disdain logical discussions or search after the principles of which the universe is composed and hence we find great refinements in sophistry and a wonderful subtlety of logical discussion though these are directed to unattainable ends to the connection of good with evil and the union of the supreme with nature nothing seemed to come out of these speculations but an occasional elevation of mind among the learned and a profound conviction of the misery of man and the obstacles to his perfection the greeks starting from physical phenomena went on in successive series of inquiries elevating themselves above matter above experience even to the loftiest abstractions until they classified the laws of thought it is curious how speculation led to demonstration and how inquiries into the world of matter prepared the way for the solution of intellectual phenomena philosophy kept pace with geometry and those who observed nature also gloried in abstruse calculations philosophy and mathematics seem to have been allied with the worship of art among the same men and it is difficult to say which more distinguished them aesthetic culture or power of abstruse reasoning we do not read of any remarkable philosophical inquirer until thales arose the first of the ionian school he was born at miletus a greek colony in asia minor about the year 636 bc when ancus martius was the king of rome and josiah reigned at jerusalem he has left no writings behind him but was numbered as one of the seven wise men of greece on account of his political sagacity and wisdom in public affairs I do not here speak of his astronomical and geometrical labors which were great and which have left their mark even upon our own daily life as for instance in the fact that he was the first to have divided the year into 365 days Quote, and he tis said did first compute the stars which beam in charles's wane and guide the bark of the phoenician sailor o'er the sea End quote. he is celebrated also for practical wisdom know thyself is one of his remarkable sayings the chief claim of thales to a lofty rank among sages however is that he was the first who attempted a logical solution of material phenomena without resorting to mythical representations thales felt that there was a grand question to be answered relative to the beginning of things philosophy it has been well said may be a history of errors but not of follies it was not a folly in a rude age to speculate on the first or fundamental principle of things thales looked around him upon nature upon the sea and earth and sky and concluded that water or moisture was the vital principle he felt it in the air he saw it in the clouds above and in the ground beneath his feet he saw that plants were sustained by rain and by the dew that neither animal nor man could live without water and that to fishes it was the native element what more important or vital than water it was the prima materia the greek arche, the beginning of all things the origin of the world how so crude a speculation could have been maintained by so wise a man it is difficult to conjecture it is not however the cause which he assigns for the beginning of things which is so noteworthy so much as the fact that his mind was directed to any solution of questions pertaining to the origin of the universe it was these questions and the solution of them which marked the ionian philosophers and which showed the inquiring nature of their minds what is the great first cause of all things thales saw it in one of the four elements of nature as the ancients divided them and this is the earliest recorded theory among the greeks of the origin of the world it is an induction from one of the phenomena of animated nature the nutrition and production of a seed 
he regarded the entire world in the light of a living being gradually maturing and forming itself from an imperfect seed state which was of a moist nature this moisture endues the universe with vitality the world he thought was full of gods but they had their origin in water he had no conception of god as intelligence or as creative power he had a great and inquiring mind but it gave him no knowledge of a spiritual controlling and personal deity anaximenes the disciple of thales pursued his master's inquiries and adopted his method he also was born in miletus but at what time is unknown probably 500 bc like thales he held to the eternity of matter like him he disbelieved in the existence of anything immaterial for even a human soul is formed out of matter he too speculated on the origin of the universe but thought air not water was the primal cause this element seems to be universal we breathe it all things are sustained by it it is life that is pregnant with vital energy and capable of infinite transmutations all things are produced by it all is again resolved into it it supports all things it surrounds the world it has infinitude it has eternal motion thus did the philosopher reason comparing the world with our own living existence which he took to be air an imperishable principle of life he thus advanced a step beyond thales since he regarded the world not after the analogy of an imperfect seed state but after that of the highest condition of life the human soul and he attempted to refer to one general law all the transformations of the first simple substance into its successive states and that the cause of change is the eternal motion of the air diogenes of apollonia in crete one of the disciples of anaximenes born 500 b c also believed that air was the principle of the universe but he imputed it to an intellectual energy yet without recognizing any distinction between mind and matter he made air and the soul identical for says he man and all other animals breathe and live by means of the air and therein consists their soul and as it is the primary being from which all is derived it is necessarily an eternal and imperishable body but as soul it is also endued with consciousness diogenes thus refers the origin of the world to an intelligent being to a soul which knows and vivifies anaximenes regarded air as having life diogenes saw in it also intelligence thus philosophy advanced step by step though still groping in the dark for the origin of all things according to diogenes must exist in intelligence according to diogenes laertius he said it appears to me that he who begins any treatise ought to lay down principles about which there can be no dispute heraclitus of ephesus classed by ritter among the ionian philosophers was born 503 bc like others of his school he sought a physical ground for all phenomena the elemental principle he regarded as fire since all things are convertible into it in one of his modifications this fire or fluid self-kindled permeating everything as the soul or principle of life is endowed with intelligence and powers of ceaseless activity if anaximenes says maurice not very clearly discovered that he had within him a power and principle which ruled over all the acts and functions of his bodily frame heraclitus found that there was life within him which he could not call his own and yet it was in the very highest sense himself so that without it he would have been a poor helpless isolated creature a universal life which connected him with his fellow men with the absolute source and original fountain of life he proclaimed the absolute vitality of nature the endless change of matter the mutability and perishability of all individual things in contrast with the internal being the supreme harmony which rules over all to trace the divine energy of life in all things was the general problem of the philosophy of heraclitus and this spirit was akin to the pantheism of the east but he was one of the greatest speculative intellects that preceded plato and of all the physical theorists arrived nearest to spiritual truth he taught the germs of what was afterward more completely developed from his theory of perpetual fluxion says archer butler plato derived the necessity of seeking a stable basis for the universal system in his world of ideas heraclitus was however an obscure writer and moreover cynical and arrogant anaxagoras the most famous of the ionian philosophers was born 500 bc and belonged to a rich and noble family 
regarding philosophy as the noblest pursuit of earth he abandoned his inheritance for the study of nature he went to athens in the most brilliant period of her history and had pericles euripides and socrates for pupils he taught that the great moving force of nature was intellect greek nous intelligence was the cause of the world and of order and mind was the principle of motion yet this intelligence was not a moral intelligence but simply the primum mobile the all-knowing motive force by which the order of nature is affected he thus laid the foundation of a new system under which the attic philosophers sought to explain nature by regarding as the cause of all things not matter in its different elements but rather mind thought intelligence which both knows and acts a grand conception unrivaled in ancient speculation this explanation of material phenomena by intellectual causes was the peculiar merit of anaxagoras and places him in a very high rank among the thinkers of the world moreover he recognized the reason as the only faculty by which we become cognizant of truth the senses being too weak to discover the real component particles of things like all the great inquirers he was impressed with the limited degree of positive knowledge compared with what there is to be learned nothing says he can be known nothing is certain sense is limited intellect is weak life is short the complaint not of a skeptic but of a man overwhelmed with a sense of his incapacity to solve the problems which arose before his active mind anaxagoras thought that this spirit greek nous gave to all those material atoms which in the beginning of the world lay in disorder the impulse by which they took the forms of individual things and that this impulse was given in a circular direction hence that the sun moon and stars and even the air are constantly moving in a circle in the meantime another sect of philosophers had risen who like the ionians sought to explain nature but by a different method anaximander born 610 bc was one of the original mathematicians of greece yet like pythagoras and thales speculated on the beginning of things his principle was that the infinite is the origin of all things he used the word arche beginning to denote the material out of which all things were formed as the everlasting the divine the idea of elevating an abstraction into a great first cause was certainly a long stride in philosophic generalization to be taken at that age of the world following as it did so immediately upon such partial and childish ideas as that any single one of the familiar elements could be the primal cause of all things it seems almost like the speculations of our own time when philosophers seek to find the first cause in impersonal force or infinite energy yet it is not really easy to understand anaximander's meaning other than that the abstract has a higher significance than the concrete the speculations of thales had tended toward discovering the material constitution of the universe upon an induction from observed facts and thus made water to be the origin of all things anaximander accustomed to view things in the abstract could not accept so concrete a thing as water his speculations tended toward mathematics to the science of pure deduction the primary being is a unity one in all comprising within itself the multiplicity of elements from which all mundane things are composed it is only in infinity that the perpetual changes of things can take place thus anaximander an original but vague thinker prepared the way for pythagoras this later philosopher and mathematician born about the year 600 bc stands as one of the great names of antiquity but his life is shrouded in dim magnificence the old historians paint him as clothed in robes of white his head covered with gold his aspect grave and majestic wrapped in the contemplation of the mysteries of existence listening to the music of homer and hesiod or to the harmony of the spheres pythagoras was supposed to be a native of samos when quite young being devoted to learning he quitted his country and went to egypt where he learned its language and all the secret mysteries of the priests he then returned to samos but finding the island under the dominion of a tyrant he fled to crotona in italy where he gained great reputation for wisdom and made laws for the italians his pupils were about three hundred in number he wrote three books which were extant in the time of diogenes laertius one on education one on politics and one on natural philosophy he also wrote an epic poem on the universe to which he gave the name of cosmos among the ethical principles which pythagoras taught was that men ought not to pray for anything in particular since they do not know what is good for them 
that drunkenness was identical with ruin, that no one should exceed the proper quantity of meat and drink, that the property of friends is common, that men should never say or do anything in anger. He forbade his disciples to offer victims to the gods, ordering them to worship only at those altars which were unstained with blood. Pythagoras was the first person to introduce measures and weights among the Greeks, but it is his philosophy which chiefly claims our attention. His main principle was that number is the essence of things, probably meaning by number, order and harmony and conformity to law. The order of the universe, he taught, is only a harmonical development of the first principle of all things to virtue and wisdom. He attached much value to music as an art which has great influence on the affections, hence his doctrine of the music of the spheres. Assuming that number is the essence of the world, he deduced the idea that the world is regulated by numerical proportions, or by a system of laws which are regular and harmonious in their operations, hence the necessity for an intelligent creator of the universe. The infinite of Anaximander became the one of Pythagoras. He believed that the soul is incorporeal, and is put into the body subject to numerical and harmonical relation, and thus to divine regulation. Hence the tendency of his speculations was to raise the soul to the contemplation of law and order, of a supreme intelligence reigning in justice and truth. Justice and truth became thus paramount virtues, to be practiced and sought as the end of life. It is impossible not to see in these lofty speculations the effect of the Greek mind according to its own genius seeking after God, if haply it might find him. We now approach the second stage of Greek philosophy. The iconic philosophers had sought to find the first principle of all things in the elements, and the Pythagoreans in number, or harmony in law, implying an intelligent creator. The Eleatics, who now arose, went beyond the realm of physics to pure metaphysical inquiries, to an idealistic pantheism, which disregarded the sensible, maintaining that the source of truth is independent of the senses. Here they were forestalled by the Hindu sages. The founder of this school was Xenophanes, born in Colophon, an Ionian city of Asia Minor, from which, being expelled, he wandered over Sicily as a rhapsodist, or minstrel, reciting his elegiac poetry on the loftiest truths, and at last, about the year 536 B.C., came to Elea, where he settled. The principal subject of his inquiries was deity itself, the great first cause, the supreme intelligence of the universe. From the principle ex nihilo nihil fit, he concluded that nothing could pass from non-existence to existence. All things that exist are created by supreme intelligence, who is eternal and immutable. From this truth that God must be from all eternity, he advances to deny all multiplicity. A plurality of gods is impossible. With these sublime views, the unity and eternity and omnipotence of God, Xenophanes boldly attacked the popular errors of his day. He denounced the transference to the deity of the human form, he inveighed against Homer and Hesiod, he ridiculed the doctrine of migration of souls. Thus he sings, Such things of the gods are related by Homer and Hesiod, as would be shame and abiding disgrace to mankind, promises broken and thefts, and the one deceiving the other. And again, respecting anthropomorphic representations of the deity, but men foolishly think that gods are born like as men are, and have to a dress like their own, and their voice and their figure. But there's but one God alone, the greatest of gods and of mortals, neither in body to mankind resembling, neither in ideas. Such were the sublime meditations of Xenophanes. He believed in the one, which is God, but this all-pervading, unmoved, undivided being was not a personal God nor a moral governor, but a deity pervading all space. He could not separate God from the world, nor could he admit the existence of a world which is not God. He was a monotheist, but his monotheism was pantheism. He saw God in all the manifestations of nature. This did not satisfy him, nor resolve his doubts, and he therefore confessed that reason could not compass the exalted aims of philosophy. But there was no cynicism in his doubt. It was the soul-sickening consciousness that reason was incapable of solving the mighty questions that he burned to know. There was no way to arrive at the truth, for, said he, error is spread over all things. It was not disdain of knowledge, it was the combat of contradictory opinions that oppressed him. He could not solve the questions pertaining to God. 
what uninstructed reason can canst thou by searching find out god canst thou know the almighty unto perfection what was impossible to job was not possible to xenophanes but he had attained a recognition of the unity and perfections of god and this conviction he would spread abroad and tear down the superstitions which hid the face of truth i have great admiration for this philosopher so sad so earnest so enthusiastic wandering from city to city indifferent to money comfort friends fame that he might kindle the knowledge of god this was a lofty aim indeed for philosophy in that age it was a higher mission than that of homer great as his was though not so successful parmenides of elia born about the year 530 bc followed out the system of xenophanes the central idea of which was the existence of god with parmenides the main thought was the notion of being being is uncreated and unchangeable the fullness of all being is thought the all is thought and intelligence he maintained the uncertainty of knowledge meaning the knowledge derived through the senses he did not deny the certainty of reason he was the first who drew a distinction between knowledge obtained by the senses and that obtained through reason and thus he anticipated the doctrine of innate ideas from the uncertainty of knowledge derived through the senses he deduced the twofold system of true and apparent knowledge Zeno of Elea, the friend and pupil of Parmenides, born 500 B.C., brought nothing new to the system, but invented dialectics, the art of disputation, that department of logic which afterward became so powerful in the hands of Plato and Aristotle, and so generally admired among the schoolmen. It seeks to establish truth by refuting error through reductio ad absurdum. While Parmenides sought to establish the doctrine of the one, Zeno proved the non-existence of the many. He did not deny existences, but denied that appearances were real existences. It was the mission of Zeno to establish the doctrines of his master. But in order to convince his listeners, he was obliged to use a new method of argument. So he carried on his argumentation by question and answer, and was therefore the first to use dialogue, which he called dialectics, as a medium of philosophical communication. Empedocles, born 444 B.C., like others of the Eleatics, complained of the imperfection of the senses and looked for truth only in reason. He regarded truth as a perfect unity, ruled by love, the only true force, the one moving cause of all things, the first creative power by which or whom the world was formed. Thus, God is love is a sublime doctrine which philosophy revealed to the Greeks, and the emphatic and continuous and assured declaration of which was the central theme of the revelation made by Jesus the Christ, who resolved all the law and the gospel into the element of love, fatherly on the part of God, filial and fraternal on the part of men. Thus did the Eleatic philosophers speculate almost contemporaneously with the Ionians on the beginning of things and the origin of knowledge, taking different grounds and attempting to correct the representations of sense by the notions of reason. But both schools, although they did not establish many truths, raised an inquisitive spirit and awakened freedom of thought and inquiry. They raised up workmen for more enlightened times, even as scholastic inquirers in the Middle Ages prepared the way for the revival of philosophy on sounder principles. They were all men of a remarkable elevation of character as well as genius. They hated superstitions and attacked the anthropomorphism of their day. They handled gods and goddesses with allegorizing boldness, and hence were often persecuted by the people. They did not establish moral truths by scientific processes, but they set examples of lofty disdain of wealth and factitious advantages, and devoted themselves with holy enthusiasm to the solution of the great questions which pertain to God and nature. Thales won the respect of his countrymen by devotion to studies. Pythagoras spent twenty-two years in Egypt to learn its science. Xenophanes wandered over Sicily as a rhapsodist of truth. Parmenides, born to wealth and splendor, forsook the feverish pursuit of sensual enjoyments that he might behold the bright countenance of truth in the quiet and still air of delightful studies. Zeno declined all worldly honors in order that he might diffuse the doctrines of his master. Heraclitus refused the chief magistracy of Ephesus that he might have leisure to explore the depths of his own nature. Anaxagoras allowed his patrimony to run to waste in order to solve problems. To philosophy, said he, I owe my worldly ruin and my soul's prosperity. 
all these men were without exception the greatest and best men of their times they laid the foundation of the beautiful temple which was constructed after they were dead in which both physics and psychology reached the dignity of science they too were prophets although unconscious of their divine mission prophets of that day when the science which explores and illustrates the works of god shall enlarge enrich and beautify man's conceptions of the great creative father end of section nine